Okay, so Musa, you've made like an, an overwhelming case against diversity training. And, and I should say, we're, we're here, we're not advocating any one line. Go out, everyone here, do your own research, read Musa's, read criticisms of Musa's work to the extent that it's out there. But okay, let's say we buy your argument, right? Diversity training as, as, as commonly practiced is not just ineffective, but toxic. Increases rates of bias, creates disincentives for those who think they've been or who have been legitimately victimized to actually feel like they have and undermines their chances of, of reporting it. So there's a whole litany of, of issues you've listed and, I, and I'm running out of paper here. But Musa, we, if you put your HR hat on, um, okay, you're, you're a sociologist, you're an academic, but if you pretend you're an HR professional, knowing what you now know, and if you were tasked with designing your own diversity program, what do you do? What are the top three, four or five things that, you know, you're, you're, the, you're the benevolent dictator here. You could do whatever you want, unlimited resources. What would you, what are some sort of really sort of the top, top things that you would, uh, top characteristics of your diversity program? What would they be? Sure. So I'll, I'll say at the top, there are things that people can do to enhance diversity um, and inclusion in organizations that don't, that are kind of separate from diversity training. Um, that have been shown to be a little bit more effective. A lot of the things that people do um, that are beyond the training are also ineffective. And, and actually Dobbin and his co-author Alexandra Kalev do a lot of work showing how some of these other things as well, like grievance procedures and things like this often backfire as well. Um, but there are some, some things other than training that people can do that are effective. Um, uh, but, but if I was just gonna zero in on training and how we can do the training differently and better, um, so there, there are a few things. So for one, uh, again, I, th I think one thing that's super important is to um, index training to people's specific roles within the organization, specific tasks and specific goals. So often, um, again, diversity training is oriented around these kind of huge goals that are not plausibly achievable through the mechanism of training. So things like in eliminating racism or sexism or you know, um, promoting inequality in the broader US society and things like, like that's just beyond the scope of what an organizational training session could plausibly achieve, right? Um, and so if you're aiming for goals that you can't realize, then you're doomed to fail, obviously. Um, and so, uh, and, and also again, when the training is overly broad or vague, it can be not clear how people can actually use the things that they're learning practically in their, in their own environment. So um, the training should be tightly indexed to specific organizational objectives, the specific tasks that different team members are responsible for. So this can help them see the relevance of the training as well. So, that, to, so it eliminates the sense of why am I here? This is a waste of time. They can more concretely see the relevance of the training and they can operationalize it like in a more practical way. Um, and, uh, and, and as part of that, the training should avoid things that are kind of orthogonal to the um, uh, uh, to to kind of people achieving these concrete tasks in the workplace. So this isn't the place, you know, the training shouldn't be a place to litigate Trump or Black Lives Matter or um, the 1619 project and whether or not America was founded fundamentally on slavery and things like like that's kind of stuff um, is not really the kind of thing that you know should be that really should have a place and, and it makes things needlessly controversial. And again, distracts, detracts from people's ability to operationalize the training in a practical way and in a concrete way in their specific roles. Um, another thing is that diversity training should be integrated into more general employee development. So rather than it being a standalone thing, it should be just part of your regular training. So if you're training people to be a manager, for instance, guess what? Avoiding nepotism or bias um, in, in, in how you give assignments and hiring and promotion, like that's not like some kind of separate diversity thing. That's just part of being a good manager, <laughs> like of being an effective manager is right. And so to the extent that, um, that the training is focused on like, how do you avoid bias and whatever, but folding that into their sort of general employee development rather than being a freestanding thing, um, that again can help make it more concrete, can help make it easier to operationalize and can reduce some of the kind of um, adversarial, adversarialism that people have with like the kind of freestanding mandatory training as it's currently practiced. 
Um, so there are a lot of benefits to that. To, um, one, uh, uh, another thing is that um, things like racism, uh, sexism, um, and things like that should be discussed as kind of as, as general cognitive trends rather than unique pathologies of like whites or, or men. So for instance, um, people generally gravitate towards other people who are like them and they tend to hold negative attitudes and demonstrate a willingness to discriminate against people who are different from themselves. This is a general, people make snap judgments about others based on how they present themselves, the context of the counter, their own life experiences and all of this. People prefer data which flatters what they already believe and they're skeptical of things that challenge their priors. These are general cognitive tendencies that have nothing to do with whites or men or heterosexuals and um, they're just general features of human cognition. Um, and so there are all these studies that show that, you know, um, uh, people who are um, African-American prefer to hire or more likely to hire and promote other African-Americans. People who are Korean are more likely to hire and promote other Koreans. People who are Muslim are more likely to hire and promote other Muslims. People who are Mormons, people who are LGBTQ are more likely to hire and promote. People who are women are more, people who graduate from Columbia are more likely to favor other people from Columbia. This is a general cognitive tendency. It has nothing to do with America's history of um, uh, slavery or anything like that. Again, so you don't even need to get into that to talk about, you know, how we have, um, uh, how, how we have, uh, and so to the extent that we that, that it's framed as this kind of general cognitive tendency, this, this does a couple of things. So one, it, 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 it prevents this kind of alienation that people feel of that they're being kind of singled out as unique, um, as uniquely depraved or something like this. Um, it helps eliminate the asymmetry that, that I talked about where the training is usually focused on helping people from, high, from say helping men engage with women, but not with helping women engage with men. Um, if you only focus on one side, on correcting misperceptions and negative attitudes on one side, but the other side continues to have negative attitudes and, mis and, and misperceptions. And in fact, sometimes the training, you know, people from um, historically marginalized and disadvantaged groups will exit the training with even more negative perceptions about people from, then you'll still have, um, right? So you really have to treat both sides of the equation if you want people to be working together, right? You can't just treat one and then not the other or make things even worse on this side. Um, so, um, so focusing on these general cognitive tendencies that people have, and then talking, then you can drill in to how these general cognitive tendencies that we have can tend to express themselves in terms of race uh, along racial lines or along gender lines, right? So these are general cognitive tendencies that can express themselves in these concrete ways that are problematic. And then you can talk about how, okay, so these general tendencies to associate with people like ourselves, they often express themselves along gender lines. Here's why that can be, you know, et cetera. People don't feel attacked in that way, again. Um, and, uh, and it's a more symmetrical approach. Um, and again, it doesn't, it, it, and it doesn't start from the assumption again that, that minorities are kind of different kinds of beings and whites or men are different kinds, et cetera. Um, uh, that, you know, dominant groups are depraved and all of this. Okay, another thing is that the training should be about managing rather than avoiding conflict. So um, conflict and misunderstanding are basically inevitable when you have people of different backgrounds and worldviews, different interests and priorities, different plans and expectations, and you're folding them into one organization to pursue some common goal when there's deadlines and pressure and a lot at stake in terms of who gets hired and promoted. Like in that kind of a situation, there's gonna be conflict. There's gonna be conflict. There's no way misunderstandings will happen, conflicts will happen. And to the extent that training is, is aimed at avoiding conflict, at suppressing conflict, often that can make things worse. So, you know, things that people have, you know, um, problems that people have don't get addressed. They just kind of hold them in and, and they, they try to bury them and suppress them. And then that can lead to, so problems go unaddressed. And then eventually they often explode into something far worse than if people, um, so if you just, if instead of that, you give people tools to, um, to engage in, to, to like lean into conflict more effectively, to have good working relationships in spite of misunderstandings, in spite of conflict, to work through conflict rather than to kind of, avoid the conflict. Um, and this is a problem because a lot of employers, what they really want actually is peace. They don't want to be bothered. <laughs> they don't want to, um, so they're, they're looking for um, how can we, you know, but actually in some ways kind of 
leaning into conflict, um, leaning into that as inevitable, that conflicts and misunderstandings will happen. Here's how you can, you know, engage in conflict more effectively, more productively, more constructively, and actually sometimes leave conflict, you know, exit conflicts with a better understanding, with a stronger working relationship, with more trust, et cetera, than you had beforehand. Um, that should be the goal. So um, managing conflict rather than avoiding conflict. And then um, uh, the last thing I'll say is that, uh, so again, I, I, diversity training should probably not be standalone. Um, but to the extent that they have standalone diversity training, instead it should be again indexed to particular roles and particular jobs. And this gives people multiple touch points. I'll add too. So, like so, for instance, um, as in, when you first start in the organization, you have one role. You're given training that's kind of indexed to the specific job you have that's related to diversity and inclusion, but 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 talking about it as part of your job, doing this role. And then if you get promoted to another one then part of your training to be, say, a manager instead of what you were doing before will include more training about how, as a manager, here, you know, here's how you can avoid bias and discrimination and things like that. So you get, you actually end up with multiple touch points of like, and, and again, they're more practically oriented and they're not these kind of weird adversarial things. But to the extent that you do kind of standalone training that's on diversity per se, that's on like sexism per se, or racism per se, or, or whatever, that's kind of separate from, then that kind of training should be um, optional rather than mandatory. And you can provide people with incentives, with like light incentives to participate. So if you participate in this training, you can take the rest of the day off or some, you know, some kind of mild incentive. Um, uh, that kind of thing can, um, encourage people to, again to, to, to enter into the training with a completely different mindset and to be able to receive the training in a different way and to view themselves as oh, okay and the last thing two last things okay two last things and really the end um, a lot of the training should be focused on kind of uh, emphasizing rather than focusing start rather than leading with the differences that people have um, they should start by focusing on superordinate identities, on shared values, on shared goals, um, and build this kind of superordinate identity first, and then you can get into the differences, right? So if you're coming from this place of, uh, of, 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 common, uh, of common ground, um, then it's easier to get into the differences within, and without feeling threatened, without feeling, um, uh, uh, without feeling adversarial, without, right? So if you, so lead with the, build common ground first and then get into the differences rather than kind of leading with the differences and then hoping that to somehow achieve common ground. Going that path is much more difficult than leading with common ground and going into differences. Okay, so that's, um, and then, uh, oh, and then the last thing to, is to focus on, on, on agency to like really, um, to really make people feel like they have power, like they like they can do something. Like this is something that is within their control, and um, to have them exit um, the training feeling like um, these are there are concrete things that I can do to make this situation better. Um, practical things, like not things involving searching in my heart and mind, but like I can go to work tomorrow, and these are some practical things that I can do that will improve the situation. Um, like so, so leaning into people's efficacy and giving them practical tools and frameworks that they can use um, is uh, is super important to have the training actually do something closer to what it's like supposed to do. Um, okay, Musa, that, that's an awesome list. <laughs>